Yes, I know. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me, Tyler. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Ho, and I am pleased to welcome you to this Ask With debate series here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. This is the second debate in this new series, which we created to address key controversies in education and model ways in which civil disagreement can promote deeper understanding. Uh, our next, uh, and now that you can hear me, it'll be more civil. Um, our next uh, Ask With debate is uh, this Thursday, right here, uh, where we will ask, what is a good citizen and how do you create one? In today's Ask With debate, we discuss whether test-based accountability has worked for US schools, teachers, and children so that we can learn from its successes and its failures. My own work as a professor here is dedicated to improving the use of educational tests. Uh, I am moderating today's debate um, among my close colleagues to my left, all of whom I know very well. I imagine that this will be like negotiating Thanksgiving dinner among contentious relatives, only with much more evidence and much less wine. <laughs> I think it's important to stress three things before I introduce my colleagues. First, I think we all understand that tests are powerful tools. Tests can be used for good and tests can be used for ill. Today's debate is not about tests in general or testing in general. It is about test-based accountability, where student test scores are the basis, at least in part, for high stakes decisions about US schools and teachers. Second, test-based accountability has seemingly straightforward logic. Good teaching causes students to learn. Tests measure learning. Why shouldn't schools and teachers who are responsible for student learning therefore be responsible for test score gains? This seemingly straightforward logic has supported a variety of implementations of test-based accountability in our state and federal policies for decades. Third, a central tenet of our Ask With debate series, and indeed the whole of the Harvard Graduate School of Education, is that civil discussion and disagreement can improve understanding. We begin with the belief that all of us here on stage and in the audience, whether we are proponents or critics of test-based accountability, we all have the best interests of students, teachers, and schools at heart, even as we may disagree about policy and practice. With that, I am honored to introduce this distinguished panel. Immediately to my left is Dan Koritz, the Henry Lee Shattuck Professor of Education here at HGSE. His classic book, Measuring Up, is the go-to citation for test score inflation and its Im implications for policy and equity. I hear he has another book in the works. Dan is a member of the National Academy of Education and a fellow of the American Educational Research Association. Next up will be Tom Kane an economist and the Walter H. Gale Professor of Education here at HGSE. Between 2009 and 2012, he directed the Measures of Effective Teaching Project for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is also the faculty director of the Center for Education Policy Research here at Harvard. Moving to the other side of the stage, we have Mitchell Chester, our Commissioner of Elementary and Secondary Education here at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. He is a member of the National Assessment Governing Board, and he received his doctorate here at HGSE. 
And we are also fortunate to have Rebecca Holcomb, Secretary of Education for the state of Vermont. She has been a middle school teacher, a high school teacher, a university faculty member, and a principal. And she directed the Dartmouth College Teacher Education Program. She also holds her doctorate from, uh, in education from HGSE. Before we begin with Dan's remarks and then proceed uh, around the circle, the semicircle, um, we would like to pull the audience here in the room um, about your beliefs on, about test-based test accountability. If you could, please take out your phones or computers and go to pollev.com slash askwithdebates. Again, pollev.com, it's up there, slash askwithdebates. Um, and answer the following question. In your experience and opinion, what has been the overall effect of test-based accountability on US schools, teaching, and kids? Again, what, in your experience, what has been the overall effect of test-based accountability on US schools, teaching, and kids? This is forced choice. <laughs> oh. Ah, if we could go. <laughs> well, this might not make uh, much sense unless, <laughs> unless we reorder this and pretend that this is the question I asked and have A, be very positive, B, be positive, C, be neither positive nor negative, D, be negative, and E, be very, uh, extremely, or very negative. Well, I just want to point out the yeah. bias in this one, right? Before they've even heard the debate, they're already, they've already decided they're going to be more negative. Well, it just... depends, depends on what they were doing 90 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> there we have a classic case of, of reference bias. Yeah. But if you interpret the results uh, as uh, written, I think there's, like, there's two ways to think about this. First, one side has a lot more work to do. Um, and the second is that there's a lot more room for you to grow, right, to make a case. So there's two ways to think about this. Um, you, can, you can see here that we're going to ask you a question afterwards and see if this debate has had any impact at, at, at all. Um, so we will begin with Dan Kortz and then proceed again around this semicircle. Um, we'll also have opportunities for rejoinders and leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and again, I look forward to addressing the question, what have we learned about the effects of test-based accountability on U.S. schools, teachers, and kids? And maybe Dan is already trying to change four the minutes, question. Right. That's minutes. right. Yeah, we have four minutes each, um, and I will have a klaxon um, uh, <laughs> just in case you go too far over. Um, so Dan, okay. we will start with you. Well, with only four minutes, all I can do is give you a very cursory summary of the main findings of 25 years of studies of America's rather peculiar forms of test-based accountability. They are unique. I'll start with the positive. There's a general agreement <coughs> that these policies have improved the mathematics performance of elementary school kids. There's some room to argue about how much, but it's not trivial. Uh, on the other hand, there's also evidence that those gains don't last, that they vanish by the time kids leave uh, high school, which is reason for doubting their value. And in reading, which has been the other primary focus of test-based accountability, there hasn't been improvement to speak of at all during the time of this, po these policies. The negative effects are unfortunately both severe and numerous. I'll start with bad test prep, which is absolutely pervasive now. Um, it takes up, in many schools, a huge amount of instructional time. And much of it, I can give examples that people would like later, is really nothing more than an attempt to game the testing system. It's not instruction. The second impact follows directly from that, which is uh, often very severe inflation of test scores. That is, gains that are far larger than actual increases in student performance would warrant. It's not uncommon to see gains that are exaggerated by a factor of three to six, creating an illusion of success. There is a growing amount of evidence that both of these problems are more severe for disadvantaged kids, which is ironic given that the reforms were designed in part to help disadvantaged kids. But it's not unusual. That's a poor way of saying it. There are studies that show, for instance, that a, a supposed narrowing of the gap between African American and white students is entirely bogus. If you test, retest the kids with a test for which they haven't been coached, the progress disappears. There's widespread cheating. 
I assume most people in the room know about scandals like the one in Atlanta, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's been documented cheating in Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Baltimore, Houston, El Paso. It goes on and on, rural Kentucky. And students here, every year, give me examples of cheating from their own schools, cases that have not reached the press. Uh, uh, they also first pointed out to me six years ago that this has resulted in a corruption of the very idea of testing, of uh, teaching, that increasingly new teachers are taught that test preparation, even of the forms that can only produce bogus gains, are good instruction. It's not a trade-off anymore. Finally, there has been a huge amount of stress on teachers, and in my view, far more important on students, to the point where some states now give teachers instructions on how to manage it when students vomit on their tests. All right, so my answer to Andrew's question is E. Uh, it has not been a total failure, obviously, but on balance, it's been a costly and serious failure. So I hope that's most of my time, um, but I'll just make a few other notes. This is not, as Andrew suggested, a matter of testing. It's a matter of the use of testing. Uh, it's a, really a function of the way in which we designed, I shouldn't say we, someone designed the accountability <coughs> systems into which we dropped testing. Those are very poorly designed. There are reasons why people predicted decades ago that systems of this sort would fail, and they have. So I hope that we can move on later in this 90 minutes to what I consider the more important questions, which is, first, what is it about this system that caused it to fail so badly? And second, what can we do differently to actually help kids more than we've helped them so far? So I'm not sure we're gonna disagree as much as we thought. Um, so <laughs> this year, Donald Trump convinced millions of voters that the economy was in a recession. Now that was quite an achievement uh, with the unemployment rate sitting at a historic low of 4.6%. That may have been good for him, but in making that case, he undercut confidence in our political system and public institutions. I and many others have been doing the same thing in US education for decades. When we make the case for change, we tend to ignore the progress being made. We, we, find, identi we identify areas where things could be better and we declare the whole thing a complete failure and prefer to start over. We're gonna regret that habit when the legitimacy of public school systems is completely gone. Because the truth is US schools have made important gains over the last 25 years, especially in fourth and eighth grade uh, math. And the evidence suggests that it is at least partly as a result of the test-based accountability systems adopted in, over the last 25 years. Since 1992, we've seen four tenths of a standard deviation growth in fourth and eighth grade math on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Those aren't small gains. That's equivalent to a whole grade level worth of growth for fourth grade, and actually more than a grade level worth of growth uh, for eighth grade. U.S. children have seen similar improvements in math on international assessments, uh, such as TIMS. Now, how can we infer that test-based accountability played a role in those? One way has been to see that the states introducing accountability systems during the 90s, before No Child Left Behind Act, saw faster growth than other states over the 90s. And more recently, um, Tom D. at Stanford and Brian Jacob at University of Michigan showed that improvements following No Child Left Behind Act were larger in the states that did not already have test-based accountability systems of their own. Rather than tossing out test-based accountability, we need to learn the lessons from the No Child Left Behind Act and help states avoid making the same mistakes under the Every Student Succeeds Act, or, or ESSA. I'm gonna to point to four specific lessons. First, it was a mistake to set a target of 100% proficiency for all schools and subgroups by 2014. It encouraged states to dumb down their standards. It distracted states' attention away from the schools in, in the most desperate need of attention. I hope we can all agree not to do that again. The good news is that ESSA does not require states to hit a goal of 100% proficiency. States are merely required to identify the bottom 5% of schools every three years and focus on them. Second, 
Single proficiency standards encourage schools to focus on students on the bubble. It was a mistake for Congress to include a single proficiency threshold in each grade and subject under No Child Left Behind. <laughs> a number of papers have shown that it simply encouraged schools to focus on kids on the bubble and to ignore both the top and bottom of the distribution. Under ESSA, states do not have to do the same thing again. Although the law requires proficiency categories, states could create multiple proficiency levels and, and put thresholds throughout the distribution that lessen uh, the bubble problem. Third, we learned that school level incentives are not enough to close achievement gaps. And we're not gonna close achievement gaps by spreading school improvement dollars thinly. We need to allocate school improvement resources on a competitive basis, set up comparison groups, and systematically measure effects of different interventions so that future school turnaround efforts start with a better evidence base. Fourth, we learned that test scores aren't everything. Under ESSA, states are allowed to include other measures from student surveys, staff surveys, <laughs> classroom observations. But rather than just add other outcomes, we should be looking for ways to use these other outcomes to try to identify schools and classrooms that are engaging in the worst cases of teaching to the test. For instance, ask students, are they spending a lot of their time doing test prep in a student survey? Now, right now, our highest priority should be to help states sift through the evidence and fix those aspects of accountability systems that need fixing. We have a new Secretary of Education whose primary focus is likely to be expanding choice through charters and vouchers. If we're interested in students, the last thing we need to do is to eliminate test-based accountability. More choice without test-based accountability systems to inform parents and policymakers when their <coughs> schools are not working would be a disaster. Commissioner. Uh, good evening. So, so um, you know, I think that, the, that we're probably asking the wrong question. So the question, could be asked in two different ways that I think would be relevant. If we're building a system solely on test-based accountability, is that likely to promote educational excellence, outstanding program of instruction for students? And I'd say absolutely not. The second way to ask that question would be, can you imagine a system that produced an outstanding program of instruction for students that didn't have a feedback loop, that didn't measure its its outcome, it's how students were, were doing, and feed that back into the system, and I can't imagine that. So the way I think about uh, test-based accountability is, along with what? I can't imagine a system, a high-performing system that doesn't have that, that feedback loop, but it's not sufficient just to measure and report and hold people accountable, uh, because then you're sort of in the business of browbeating and and, uh, and so forth. Now I think Massachusetts is an outstanding example, and I uh, call out Paul Revel, who's here, who's, who's part of the architecture of the Massachusetts system going back to the early 90s, where uh, it's a system that decided to uh, make a substantial additional financial investment in the educational sector in a very progressive way so that districts with towns, communities with the least ability to raise their own revenue would get a greater proportion of their revenue from the state. It's a system that decided to set standards and did it by setting very high standards, very aspirational standards in terms of student learning and to build that feedback loop through an assessment that, uh, that measured, that was aligned with those standards uh, and provided feedback to the system about where we were succeeding and where we weren't succeeding. And it's, it's that combination of factors uh, along with the support systems and the intervention systems that have developed over the last 20 years and have been upgraded based on experience that has propelled Massachusetts. Now, uh, Dan's comments about uh, you, you, you can't trust the test score gain, well, one of, one of the gold standards is are there other measures that confirm the test score gain? And when you look at the Massachusetts data, not only has the state 
uh, the results on the state system improve pretty steadily over time. There's some variation depending on what grade level, what subject we're looking at. But overall, pretty substantial. Well, we have some external markers as well. We participate in the NAEP, the National Assessment of Education Progress, and Massachusetts was never a low performing state, but wasn't at the top either. And we have been at the top, second to no other state in performance for about 10 years now. Tomorrow, the latest PISA results will be released, the, the international assessment of 15-year-olds. I'm not allowed to tell you <laughs> what happened uh, or what will happen tomorrow. Massachusetts participated as a separate entity from the United States. The United States has participated in PISA since 2000, the first time it was given. This is the second time Massachusetts has participated. We participated in 2012 and again in 2015. And those results are going to be incredibly confirming of, of <laughs> You can't repeat that outside of this room. Uh, being live of, of, of the. Uh, uh, <laughs> All he said was confirming. That's right. That's right. So, so, um, so I, I think that I think that to, to say is this test-based accountability work or not work? Well, it doesn't work by itself. I can't imagine a system where it worked by itself, uh, and I can't imagine a system that didn't have a feedback loop and some accountability for results that was a high performing system. Secretary. I would phrase the question as what's the right way to use test scores to improve equity and to improve learning. And in the state of Vermont, one of our strongest commitments in all policy is equity. I think it's why we have some of the narrowest achievement gaps in, this, in the country. Um, and I think it's really important to make sure, due to the kinds of examples that Dan gave, <clears throat> that we aren't replacing one kind of inequity with another, which is hidden, which is inequitable distribution of good, rich opportunities to learn beyond the tested subjects. And certainly in our Vermont data, we were one of the only states not to apply for a waiver under race to the top, so we never evaluated teachers by test scores, and we were the only state to have to label every single public school in the state of Vermont a low-performing school, even even though we're consistently in the top five performing states on NAEP in the country. So it, it's an interesting, different discussion, but I worry as we went into that that we saw declines in performance in other academic areas, which suggested people were neglecting those areas to do better on the state test. So I guess I would approach it a different way, and, and let's just assume that the kinds of concerns people here have all observed weren't weren't, that weren't real and that we believe these tests really do what people say that they can do. And I would say in the context of Vermont, what we see is that test-based accountability isn't working because if it did work, we would expect to see faster gains in schools that were subject to test-based accountability. Um, and we are an unusual uh, state in that we actually have three systems that run in parallel, only two of which are subject to test-based accountability. We have um, a very small state and many of our towns are very, very rural. They're too small to operate their own schools. We're a very white state, 93% of our students are white, and I would say in all of our three systems, which I'll explain to you, we have very similar demographics. Our biggest subgroups are kids who live in poverty, rural students really is, a, is an area that we need to do better, and then um, students with disabilities. Our three systems are public schools that are big enough to report on performance, and those would be public schools like in most states. Um, but about 30% of our school districts have 100 or fewer children. Children. So we have a lot of public schools that are too small to publicly report on any data at all. So in many senses, these schools are so small, they have class sizes sometimes of five, there is no meaningful test-based accountability for them and that data is never public. Um, and then we also have a series of towns that are too small to operate their own schools and they tuition their students to some public schools but also to private schools. So we pay them and one of the conditions of accepting those students into those private schools is that they have to test our students using the exact same tests. So if test-based accountability really created better outcomes, we would expect gains for students to be greatest in the public system where the schools are big enough to report. And what we see is that they're almost identical across all three of those systems. There is no substantive difference, and they all have the same demographics, so I don't think it's a, a, a sorting issue. So I guess the question for us, if, if overall these trends are almost 
identical across all of these systems, two of which really functionally don't have test-based accountability, it really raises the question of why 14 years of high-stakes test-based accountability haven't resulted in the positive outcomes we'd expect to see for our students. And I think it's because while test-based accountability can tell us how we are doing, it doesn't actually give us a lot of insight on how we could do better. And that's where I really put my faith more in some of the kinds of professional accountability that I see making the difference in Vermont schools. It also raises questions to me about why we're embarking on another round of test-based accountability with ESSA without considering if this is actually an efficient and effect effective way to use our resources. Um, one of my favorite professors here at Harvard was Richard Murnay, who always taught us to think about the value of the investment. And if the return isn't there, you need to think about the opportunity cost of not putting your dollars someplace else. And in the context of Vermont, what we see is that test-based accountability isn't just a poor use of money because that money could be spent on professional development, on extended learning opportunities for children and other things that in research we see make a difference for our kids. But as Tom, I'm, I'm pleased to hear you say that, it erodes public confidence in public institutions and in the capacity of government to tackle vexing challenges and growing inequality, which is a travesty given the, the profound challenge around inequality we have. Under No Child Left Behind, again, we had to label every single public school in our state a low-performing school. So the effect and the legacy of No Child Left Behind in Vermont is to create a relentless negative narrative of local public school failure, even though we know that our students in public schools perform just as well as their peers in private schools in the state of Vermont. We know it's detrimental because it discourages teachers of our most disadvantaged students for doing exactly what we want our best and most skilled teachers to do. We want our best teachers to embrace the challenge and the privilege of teaching and supporting our most vulnerable students. And I remember speaking to a teacher in a high school. When students came to her, they were often four or five grade levels below the, the grade level that they were in at the high school. And she could move them three years, and it still would not be picked up on the grade level tests we're required to use in the high school. And so the effect of that accountability in her context is to discourage people like that from trying to work in those, in those areas. It's That's also detrimental minute. because it rewards schools for focusing on the very narrow definition of a achievement, and I think the one that upsets me the most is that it really sanctions schools where the community may not have had the resources or the professional capital to mitigate the unique challenge of concentrated numbers of disadvantaged children. And in our state, where the schools are often the only institutions in those towns, when you hurt the school, you hurt the community. And we want to strengthen those communities and strengthen those children and their capacity to help their children. Thank you. So we now have time for um, three minute rejoinders uh, in the same order, um, although I have a feeling that this might devolve soon and uh, evolve into more, of a, uh, into more of a free flowing discussion. So we'll start with Dan. Well, hard to choose. Uh, let me start with something that in different ways both you, Tom, and Mitchell, you said. I think you conflated two different things. One is a feedback loop and the other is uh, high stakes testing. And to step back, what we do in this country is, to my knowledge, unique. I don't know of any other countries that do this, and a lot of them do better than we do. So it's hard to start off with the premise that we have to do this. There are countries that have um, feedback, test-based feedback loops and high performance, with, excuse me, without high stakes. Uh, the Netherlands is a fine example of that. It has a very well-established testing system in total choice and no high stakes for test scores. There are high-performing high systems that have no feedback loop at all, like Finland. And even in some countries where tests really matter, like Singapore, there are no tests at all in most grades, none. And the government of Singapore, which is one of the highest performing countries in the, in the world, is struggling to reduce the focus on tests in its schools because they consider the focus on test scores to be detrimental to the well-being of their students. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, Tom, you mentioned monitoring for test prep. I can't applaud that loudly enough. But we've created a system in which absolutely nobody has an incentive to do that. One of the really bizarre things about test-based accountability in the United States is that everybody from the lowest <coughs> level person to the superintendent has exactly the same incentive, which is to raise scores as fast as possible. No one has an incentive to look at how or to tamp down bad test prep. This is a model some of us who are old enough should remember very well. It's how the Soviet Union uh, uh, designed its, uh, its industrial system. And while it, did, it wasn't a total failure, they produced fearsome tanks, they also produced shoes that nobody bought. And that's basically what we've done. It's not an accident that in many of the most extreme documented cases of bad test prep and outright cheating, teachers have been induced by the people superior to them to do it. The very people that you would have monitor them 
are in fact telling them to do it. Um, so one last point. The starting point for any rational accountability system, and this is well established in fields outside of education, has to be enumerating the most important goals. There is simply no way to get an effective accountability system if we don't do that, and we have not done that. ESSA doesn't do it. ESSA, for instance, says that you have to have, or you may have, one additional measure besides test scores and graduation. But it doesn't matter what, as long as it differentiates among schools. You want the, the proportion of kids completing advanced courses? Fine. You want student engagement? Fine. Those aren't substitutes in my book. I don't think having more kids taking EP classes is a substitute for making sure that fourth grade math lessons are engaging. So I think we really have to step back and rather than argue about the details of ESSA or NCLB, start at the beginning and say, what do we want to see in schools and what do we need to reward and support teachers for doing? Do you, Tom, do you, you want to take first shot at that or? Yeah, so yeah. I, uh, I, I think we're going through. Yeah, we're like, going through an like, order. Oh, okay, like, got it. Like, unless got Dan it. says your name and got then you the, get three minutes or is that how it works? Oh, God. <laughs> no, no, no. I yield no. to <laughs> No, let's go, not go do that. <laughs> so they're basically, they're just, three different mm -hmm. types of feedback loops. There, there's no such thing as a system with absolutely no um, feedback loops. The three are administrative or test-based, right. second, market or choice-based, and the third is political um, feedback for the political leaders that are running the institution. What we learned in the US prior to the early 90s is that the political feedback loop was not enough. That local, um, eight local governments, when they were the primary source of political feedback, allowed large gaps to develop and allowed huge differences in achievement to develop between different um, local authorities. Now, many of the countries, Dan, that, that you talk about have some kind of market or, or choice system. So for instance, sure. Finland has, has sure. choice. Sure. And so I would just argue that the mix of what are the types of accountability that, that we use will vary country by country. And I, I just think that we learned that the world where we didn't have any accountability system, <clears throat> where it was, or where it was based on political accountability, didn't work for us. I don't disagree. And so, Either we go to choice or we go to test-based, which I, my guess is there's not a huge constituency in this room for, um, or we go to test some kind of administrative accountability that we need to work on trying to make better. Um, second, the high failure rates, Rebecca, that, that you described in the large proportion of schools in uh, Vermont that were failing AYP, there's no need to replicate that under ESSA. So, so the thing that was creating that was the 100% proficiency rate target that they started out with. Um, and hopefully you won't make that mistake again in submitting your own, your own plan. Um, the, um, so the goal cannot be zero evidence of, of, of malfeasance, like if we target any evidence of, of malfeasance as evidence against test-based accountability, then that would be equivalent to saying, look, you know, any case where the uh, a consumer makes the wrong choice means that we can't have a market, or, or any evidence of a wrong political choice means we can't have a political um, sor source of, 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 of feedback. The key is whether or not we see gains from the test-based accountability systems that we create, whether those gains are large enough to, set, to, to pay for the costs, and whether or not um, there are ways to try to mitigate them. I actually think that, that we should be, there are ways that we could be designing our accountability system to mitigate those risks. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think Mitch and Rebecca, who will be setting up these rules, want to see teaching to the test. I mean, I agree that the, the folks setting up the system could try to guard against some of these worst uh, cases that, that, that you describe. Um, and 
and I'd encourage them to do that. Now, Rebecca described data from Vermont on whether or not th th these three different groups of schools. Um, and that, that's, it would be interesting to compare the results there with, the, with all the other evidence I just cited, mm -hmm. where, where it has been true, just as a general um, thing, that in the, in the states that introduced test-based accountabilities during the 90s, those states saw faster gains. When No Child Left Behind Act was created, the states that didn't already have an accountability system saw faster gains. Now, they saw faster gains in fourth and eighth grade math, not so much in reading, not so much in high school. So I'd love to like mm -hmm. parse the Vermont data to see if, even though overall it looks pretty similar, whether you see the same thing that in certain grades and subjects, the the groups of schools that were subject to the accountability system saw faster gains. We should get some students right on that. Um, Commissioner. Yeah, just to punctuate you one point that, that, <laughs> one point that uh, Tom made, uh, it's not as though before we had uh, these accountability systems and these testing regimes that great things were happening for kids and there was a greater equity in the outcomes for kids. So uh, I want to you know, make that clear because there is a certain narrative that I run into quite a bit which is a nostalgia for an age before the one that we know now as though somehow poor kids, kids of color, uh, were doing a lot better uh, in that age and uh, that's far from the truth, far from the truth. Now I, I, I believe very strongly that uh, in any system you need to guard against unintended, uh, un unproductive behaviors and responses to that system, right? So to the extent that we have schools where the best ideas that the educators can come up with to improve results is to narrowly teach kids how to do well on what they think will be on the test in a few months, uh, that's, that's, that's uh, not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. And, and um, uh, at some level, those adults have responsibility for doing right by those kids, right? And there's a whole system around that responsibility and providing feedback. Some of it emanates from the state. I mean, some of it emanates from the federal government requiring the states to have accountability systems. Some of it emanates from the state in terms of the accountability system that's set up and the signals sent to schools and districts about where we're succeeding and where we're not. And some of that is a district and school-based responsibility in terms of seeking out the strongest forms of uh, instruction, the str strongest approaches to curriculum, the strongest programs that are out there. We can't abrogate our responsibility as educators because the state has a testing regime. Now, I am very, very persuaded by some of the research that uh, Richard Elmore has done around the notion that institutions that have strong internal accountability, where the adults feel it's their responsibility to figure out how to deliver a strong program of instruction. When an external accountability system is imposed, they thrive under that. They figure out how to use that to further what they were up to and committed to anyways. Those institutions where there's weak internal accountability, where there's not a culture of, if, it's, if we're not getting to the kids, it's our responsibility to look at other ways of delivering instruction, organizing for school, and so forth. It's those places that when an external accountability is imposed that they struggle. So we're trying to figure out in Massachusetts context ways to deal with those schools that are struggling the most, where not only is, is achievement quite low, and some of these places are, are places that uh, you and I would never enroll our own children in if you saw what was happening with these instructional programs. We're trying to figure out how to, what is the right intervention, what's the right uh, engagement with those schools and those school districts to move the needle there. And we've made some, some pretty good progress. It hasn't been universal success, but a lot of success, and we could get into some of that. But if we're not shining a light on where Account where achievement is stuck, 
where kids are literacy skills and math skills are quite low and they're not moving up over time. And those places exist. If we're not shining a light on those places, then, then we're doing a disservice to those children. We are absolutely handicapping their future. Shining a light's not enough because then, then the question is what are the right interventions and that's a work in progress. Likewise at the top end, if we're not doing enough to shine a light on where we're excelling and figuring out what's happening there that we can learn from, then we're not doing enough. We're wasting opportunity to capitalize on educators who are figuring this out, who we can all learn from. So I feel very strongly that, that um, the test-based, I called it a feedback loop, accountability is a big part of it. For me, it's uh, results have to matter. These are kids' lives that are at stake in these schools. And if we don't get it right in these schools, these kids move through with very weak skills into a world that's, that's not going to have many opportunities for them. Secretary. I, I absolutely agree that we have to hold ourselves professionally accountable for uh, you know, improving outcomes. And, and um, again, I think equity is one of our strongest priorities. It's been our consistent first decision point in every decision we've made with respect to ESSA. I think Vermont was one of the four states that I'm aware of that didn't cheer when ESSA passed because it is still a case of ranking. And we like to think of those 5% of schools that will have to identify sort of like a reading recovery group. You pick the ones that are lowest, you in intensely in invest in them to bring them up into the middle of the distribution. But it is still hard for the school at the sixth percentile that doesn't get that attention and those resources and still has to live with that ranking. And it's, you know, it's something they have to deal with. But nothing with. would prevent but you can, from, can from designing a system that includes that that's, sixth that's, and seventh percentile, That's actually not true, right? and we don't have time to go through ESSA tonight. Okay. Happy to have that conversation at a different time. But, but what I would say is that what we have chosen to do is to hold ourselves publicly accountable for the data. So we will produce on an annual basis, a data snapshot. It's an online platform for every system that gives them data on academic achievement in a whole bunch of different ways, but also gives them feedback on things like school climate and culture, engagement, preparation of faculty, support for professional development, a whole range of indicators, personalization of learning that speak to the breadth and depth of the kinds of opportunities. The only things that can go into the annual snapshot are the kinds of things that you might put into a federal plan. They're things that you can count. But in addition to that, and one of the initiatives that we're really most excited about is we are building a process of integrated field reviews that are really modeled after European inspectorate models. Okay. And what we are doing is we are creating a process by which teams of educators and experts from the agency of education and professionals in the field go and visit other school systems, gather uh, qualitative data in response to the goals, in response to a set of prompts, and then create an elaborate qualitative and quantitative report that they then return to that system as, a, as an external review or inspection of their work towards their stated goals. And I have to tell you, those have been the most exciting thing I've been part of in my professional career. One of the things I'm really proud of is that they involve students. So students are part of the host team. And there is nothing like a student to tell you the truth about what is or isn't happening <laughs> in the classroom. Let me tell you, because you'll hear the administrator say, well, we do this, this, and this. And the student will say, well, that's only for these kids, these kids over here. And what it does is it holds us professionally accountable for making sure that what we do for our children is what we actually say we're doing. And, and that's, that's really important. So I think you need those two pieces. And you know, I think of my, my dissertation work in Los Angeles, where I interviewed principals who were using academic growth measures and also the Danielson framework for evaluating teachers. Some of you have probably used it. And every single one of them could identify a case where those scores on the AGT told a very different story than what they saw based on their observation. Mm -hmm. And I offer that because I really don't think there is a way to create a great system that doesn't have as its heart professional judgment. We absolutely need this data. It would be absolutely irresponsible not to use it. But the data itself needs us to exercise judgment about how to use it to inform better efforts to improve kids. Mm -hmm. So l let me ask, because um, I don't want to lose the idea of uh, accountability, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we are, seem to be switching the definition as it suits us to responsibility, to feedback loops, and to shining lights. Um, and what's the difference between accountability and all of that is that at the, at the at first, I think there's a hint of a lack of trust 
right? Um, and also, there, there, there is a very clear signal that if you don't do this, right, if you aren't, you know, in, internally, um, uh, uh, if you don't have any sort of internal responsibility, then there has to be this external responsibility. So, so one of the questions we have listed here, what are promising models of test-based accountability that you've seen in the US or abroad, and what can we learn from them? And I want to ask you to be very specific about what are the stakes in models that you think might work? Um, what happens when people, when it doesn't work in Vermont? What happens when even after all you've done in those cases, and you mentioned these schools, but I'd like to get a little bit more specific about what those stakes should be and what we should do, because those cases arise and are, are ongoing. And I don't want to lose the idea that you know, what we're debating here is accountability, so we should be specific about the stakes. So maybe we could start by like, what are the stakes for schools that don't work in these cases? Uh, and what, do you, what promising models do you see for, mm -hmm. for the use of stakes um, in, uh, in test-based accountability systems? So the, the first thing I would say is when we talk about stakes associated with accountability, it's rare that we talk about the stakes for kids. I like to start there. At least directly, yes. A young person who doesn't learn, doesn't leave school with strong literacy skills, math skills, and a broad education, a deep education, but without strong literacy skills, without math skills that can be applied, is a young person whose life is handicapped, whose opportunity and options are handicapped. So I want to start there with stakes, because we, we typically start the conversation with the stakes for the adults in the system. And uh, so one of the things that intrigues me is, and, and, and uh, Tom and Dan can correct me if I've got a an inaccurate read on the research, but when you look in at the variation in effectiveness of adults, because we're not all equally effective teachers, that variation is substantial, quite substantial. And in fact, that variation accounts, is, is a larger part of the total variation in student achievement than the between, the within school Teacher to teacher variation is a much bigger part of the variation than the between school or between district variation that we see. And so I'm a fan of a system that requires the faculty in a school to come together around what does it mean to teach a US history course? What are we trying to get kids, what are we trying to have kids get out of this course? Fourth grade. Literature, what are we trying to get out of fourth, a year in a fourth grade ELA class? Seventh grade math, what are we trying to get? And how do we know collectively, we're all the seventh grade math teachers, let's start by agreeing on what we're trying to accomplish, and then how will we know? What measures will we use? And then how will we come together to look at how effective and how impactful we are uh, individually and as a group and what can I learn? I'm the weak link here. Gosh, you guys are all, your kids are accomplishing a lot. I don't get it. And, and, and give me the opportunity to get some help there, but don't leave us on our own bottoms. So that, that, that's a theory of action, but again, what happens when that doesn't work, right? So, so which is to say, I mean, I think what Dan is critiquing is this, is, is like when that doesn't work, what do we do to schools well, and teachers? The question is also what you, what you attach sanctions to. I mean, just to make this conversation, I think, more productive, I think we can stipulate certain things. I don't think anybody here is opposed to accountability. Certainly there's nobody here who is content with low <laughs> levels of student achievement. And I don't think there's anybody here who, who would disagree with the notion that testing systems could be done better to avoid some of these problems. The question is, uh, is there, are there some larger changes we can make that will uh, substantially change the mix of negative and positive effects? Nothing's going to get rid of the negative effects, but we can change the mix. I would start by saying that the systems that look uh, uh, promising to me follow the premise that, that Rebecca stated, they all involve human judgment. One of the ca characteristics of our system that is actually internationally quite peculiar is that it, it, it's designed not to allow professional judgment, and that's partly because the system before this didn't work. I mean, I, I think we agree on that also. But the fact is, it's very hard to, to evaluate schools properly and to reward and, uh, and, and sanction the right things if you don't look at them. 
if you don't use professional judgment. If you look at, for instance, the system in Singapore, uh, it's clear that tests do have some a substantial positive effect on achievement, or at least on what the Ministry of Education considers too narrow as a, a portion of achievement. Uh, but the evaluation that matters for teachers is virtually free of test scores. Virtually? It, virtually. Well, I'll, I'll explain exactly what that means. There's a very elaborate system called the EPMS, which does not even mention test scores. Mm -hmm. Informally, principals often do use test scores. But the main purpose of the um, system is to use both internal and external um, monitoring, observation, to first help new teachers better their performance, and second, if they can't better the performance, to leave. And they do leave, which is one of your concerns with our system, that the evaluation system hasn't been causing enough people to leave. So I, I just think that the, the sanctions should be, first of all, there should be support before there are sanctions, which mm -hmm. I think is generally agreed upon. But I think the biggest problem is, is what we're currently rewarding. We're rewarding test prep. Tom? So I would uh, um, agree on one point and disagree on another, Dan. Mm -hmm. So I would agree on the point that we have to create we have to preserve some judgment in, in these systems, whether, and that applies to teacher retention and even potentially the, the school, uh, comprehensive um, mm -hmm. school reforms. Um, but I would, I would say the way to do that is by combining the test-based measures with the other measures. So Rebecca, you described the teachers that, that had very high observation scores, but weak value-added scores. No, it was the, a lot of times it was the other way around. Well, because mm -hmm. I was going to say, mm -hmm. there were certainly teachers who have strong value-added scores, but weak mm -hmm. on the observation. They're using unconventional teaching processes, using methods that don't look good on the Danielson rubric, and yet are producing results. Now, you want to make sure they're not just getting it by teaching to the test, mm -hmm. but only when we see both of those pieces of data do we, do we get to recognize those opportunities. The school inspections. I would be very afraid of a system of school inspections that wasn't complemented by the, the, sure. the sure. student achievement gain sure. or growth measures. Why? Well, because sure. I, there are lots of places in education where conventional wisdom and expert judgment has developed that it's just plain wrong about what's the right way to teach something. Um, and if there is not a system that, that puts the inspections to the test by saying, are these consistent on average, not in every case, but on average with the, with the student growth, then we're gonna miss out. So, so I think it's, I, believe that student growth measures should play a role in teachers' evaluations, but I don't think it should ever be the only um, uh, measure. Do, do you all agree, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to Rebecca, but maybe I can phrase this as a question to you, is, uh, is if you had to pick a percentage, uh, what, what percent of the process should be informed by test, student test scores? By growth? I mean, I, I was gonna actually respond to that. I mean, there's a paradox in growth, I just, just want to put this out. So when we decide for our SS state plan how much to weight growth measures versus status scores, there's a paradox because some of our lowest performing schools are appear to be some of our schools that have the greatest growth. And they don't they want to be recognized for their growth, but if you recognize them for the growth, you're not actually <coughs> driving your dollars under ESSA to the schools that are least resourced and most need the additional support. So we have a paradox. We can choose to have, likewise, some of our greatest gaps are actually in some of our higher scoring schools. And frankly, as a student in Vermont, you are a lot better off in some of our overall mean score lower mm -hmm. schools than you are in some of our high scoring schools because they just don't take care of their kids in poverty, for example, the same way. And so I, I think that you, you need to think about the consequences of all of these decisions made, that you make, and for us, again, it's always about equity. What is going to get in federal accountability? The dollars. This is a civil rights law. Mm -hmm. What is going to get these civil rights dollars to the communities that need them the most that we have historically poorly served? Mm -hmm. So that it's not necessarily going to recognize growth as much as we'd like to because if we do, we're not going to get it where it needs to go. That's a strategic choice to make sure we're supporting gains in the communities that need that support the most. So it's not in terms of what the percentage is. It's we're obligated to some extent to have the test scores be 
you know, the proportion it is in ESSA. Frankly, the, in terms of the technical criteria for the other indicators, mm -hmm. there's not much difference between how they perform and the test scores. Right. So it really is, if we limit it to test scores, um, to the, in academics, it's not going to make much difference what percentage it is. And so I, I throw something, because yeah. there's a missing piece here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about mm -hmm. complementing other measures with test scores, which makes perfect mm -hmm. sense to me. But it's, we're missing one of the obvious consequences of now t more than 25 years worth of research, which is in this system, you can't trust scores to do that. It's as simple as that. Because we have very good evidence that not only is, is uh, score inflation severe, it's non-uniform. And it's non-uniform in systematic ways. All right, so part of what we are doing when we complement other measures with test scores is we're rewarding bad test prep. And you, it's very easy to find teachers who will say, well, I've given up X because it doesn't raise scores as fast as using M, uh, Princeton Review's cracking just, the MCAT yeah, I, just, I think it's important. I want to be careful. I don't think every teacher who engages what, in what you would call test prep is, thinks they're doing that. Let me oh, give you an no, example that goes sure. back to the science. I, know. I interviewed a principal in Los Angeles who talked about his, his reason for the discrepancy is that the science standards in California emphasize inquiry, but it's very difficult to test inquiry in a standardized sure. test. No. So what they were right. doing was emphasize the content knowledge on the test, which is why when they get to college, I hear people like the Dartmouth professors say that students are great on tests, but they can't okay. develop a novel I, idea. I agree. So I, I just, it's not that they're, what they're doing is they're looking at what items their students got incorrect, and then they're working backward from that into what I absolutely agree. I just want yeah. to make the point yeah. that if we want mm -hmm. to use test scores productively mm -hmm. as a complement to other measures, mm -hmm. we have to use, we have to set up a set of incentives that doesn't right. so badly right. distort the scores that we get. Such as? Right. Such as one that has lower stakes, that has targets that people but can reach no by stakes. least. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. I, I won't take more time, but if you want to get into different mm -hmm. forms of stakes, happy to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, in the, in the interest of, of making this Thanksgiving dinner end with mm -hmm. everyone on a happy <laughs> note, I mean, is, isn't this just a, an, another um, uh, multiple measures um, uh, approach that most of us are advocating for with mm -hmm. a little bit of professional judgment and a non-zero percentage on test scores? Not if you take Campbell's Law into, a, into account. But that, that's quite... That's no, C Campbell's Law mm -hmm. was... Which, which is? So, so, so <laughs> Campbell's... So, so to paraphrase what is usually cited incompletely mm -hmm. as Campbell's Law is mm -hmm. the argument that any numeric measure um, will, um, tend, it will tend to distort um, uh, behavior. The stakes will distort yeah. the indicator. Yeah. But here's, here's the way that that is incomplete, is that several paragraphs later, later in the same document that is often cited as Campbell's mm -hmm. Law, mm -hmm. Don Campbell said, the obvious um, solution to this mm -hmm is to include multiple measures. I agree with that. So, so it's not a solution, it ameliorates the problem. Yes, yeah. right, in fact, in, that's the verb he used, I think. Because our, our fail mind <laughs> <fail laughs> can't keep track so of put all the measures. measures <laughs> yeah. Can I go back, I just want to go back. I thought your way of analyzing accountability was really interesting, Tom, and I, and I like the point you make about school choice. And again, Vermont's an interesting state because we have actually statewide public school choice. And what we see is that people don't actually exercise it to go to schools that are strong academic schools. They make decisions about choice based on who has a hockey team or whatever. So you know, I think that in our context, we can't count on that to be the driver for improvement. Mm -hmm. We need, that's why I think we need this high stakes data platform that we're putting together, but we also need this process of, for state purposes of inspectorates or, or field reviews mm -hmm. to do both. I, wanna, I, wanna, I agree, I thought that was a very helpful breakdown mm -hmm. of, um, of, of stakes. Um, and so I, I wanna close on a note that, that um, and then open mm -hmm. up to questions, um, but, but Tom raised the point about public trust in our schools, and I just wanna um, to ask, how can we use, how can we use test-based accountability carefully, strategically, not only to improve schools and learning, but also rebuild trust in public education. Because it seems that we all agree that we should use them cautiously, but we should also use them, you know, this is an era of, of, op, of the opt-out moment. This is an era with immense distrust about federal and even state level intervention. How can we use tests wisely, carefully to, to, to again, rebuild trust, as Tom said, um, in, in the education system? Well, I hope... Um, <laughs> that when you read the Boston Globe tomorrow, there'll be a nice story <laughs> on the front page. Uh, I, can't say anything, I can't say anything more than that. Uh, 
Now, whether that'll help build trust or not, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting that uh, in Massachusetts, we learned from some research uh, this past spring and summer mm -hmm. that there's uh, a fairly low level of awareness, not only among the general population, but among educators uh, about the performance of the K-12 system compared to the rest of the nation. Uh, among educators, about half of the educators understand that, and among the general citizenry, it's about one third, which which surprised me uh, uh, quite a bit. But there's an interesting discussion uh, in Massachusetts that's unfolding right now. Um, there's there's a, a big push to put more money into the school funding formula, um, and parallel to that. Uh, and, and you know, if, if there's anybody here from the um, from the teachers unions, I'd, I'd I'd love to hear you respond to what I'm about to say. Parallel to that, the the teachers unions, I think, in part, feeling pretty emboldened by having uh, led the charge to defeat the charter cap lift uh, bill, not bill, but um, ballot initiative, uh, are now not only advocating for greater funding, but for less accountability. And if it seems to me, and I haven't done a poll, but as for the average taxpayer to be, to be asked, dig deeper into your wallet, but trust us, let the education, give the education community more dollars, but we're actually going to have less accountability, doesn't seem to me to be a, uh, a formula for public trust. Okay. I think for us, it's been about much more transparency and much more in the way of efforts to engage the public. And we're a little unusual in that our schools are governed by school boards. I think mm -hmm. we now have 58 kids per school board member in the state of Vermont. I mean, I just to give you a sense of how small we are. <laughs> so we have we Boy, have the kids. kinds of public engagement that people pay for in other states and people are you know ferociously attached to their schools and that's our strength and it's also our weakness because it sometimes makes us blind when there are challenges so part of what we've tried to do is work to systematically give people better data to evaluate their efforts, the value of the investment that they're making in their young people, um, and, and try to make that conversation more public. And we've worked very hard to try to mitigate what we see as some of the worst consequences of test-based accountability. And we've also tried to pivot the discussion. You know, as We were one of the two states that didn't vote on the uh, proficiency thresholds and the smarter balance. We cited you, Andrew, <laughs> <laughs> in that. But, but to when we present, presented our scores, for example, Example, we presented them not as a mean score, but as a scatter plot of all the school scores in the state so people could see the variation. Because yeah. our issue in the state is variation. As you said, mm -hmm. we have some schools that are phenomenal, and we have some schools that really need to get better. And if we can show people that even schools with 40 or 50 percent kids living in poverty are doing far better than schools that are serving more affluent populations in a state that, you know, you know, I think we've, we've tried to deal with some of the worst effects of high stakes accountability. I think that makes it a powerful case that we all have to take responsibility for getting the best results we can for our kids. I think the key may actually ironically be accountability. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I certainly don't argue mm -hmm. for going back to a system that I would characterize actually as no accountability, virtually no accountability. Mm -hmm. Virtually? Just political. Uh, yeah, well, it was barely even that. I mean, I mm -hmm. saw as a public school teacher and as a parent both, the almost total lack of accountability for behavior. Uh, I mean, if you don't extort or do something else, you, you know, they're really out of line, you, you can just do whatever you want. Uh, I think the only way to build trust is to gradually build an alternative accountability system, one that does, in fact, hold people accountable more than we used to, say, mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years ago, but that has a better mix of incentives, a better mix of measures, and has a better mix of positive effect for kids. So I personally, and. In this, I wasn't criticizing anybody. I was accepting blame myself. I, I, I have stood on this stage and started out many times with graphs showing flat NAEP scores and then using that as a motivation for some policy proposal. And I do think ultimately that is damaging. I think what we need to do is be more clear about acknowledging progress that's been made. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm gonna personally uh, 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 try to do a much better job of that, while also being honest about the things that need to change. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I, I think mm -hmm. if, if we all in the education debate get out of the mode of saying everything is a complete failure, we need to start again, um, and instead try to acknowledge the, the areas where we have made progress and then identify, frankly, the areas where we need to improve, I, I think as, as a whole, um, I, I think it would actually change the nature of the education uh, debate if, if, if more, if, if we all agreed to, to start to do that. I hope so, and we'll gather some evidence about that shortly. <laughs> um, so why don't we open it up to, um, to the floor for questions. We have about 20 minutes, um, and then we'll pull you again. Um, there is a mic, um, uh, in, uh, there are two mics, um, one in each aisle, and if you line up behind them, um, we will uh, alternate. Go ahead, sir. Sure. Hi, my name is Aaron Boslin. I am a high school teacher and instructional coach from Miami who's studying education policy here at the uh, Ed School. And my parents are both uh, high school teachers in Vermont. And the question I have is that I'm glad that the secretary pointed out uh, several times how unique a situation Vermont is, is that for me as a teacher and as an instructional coach in Miami Dade County Public Schools, the system I worked in had nearly as many people as the state of Vermont. And I, <laughs> that and is it's true. not like a funny joke. I mean, it is funny, it's but it's true. like, it's true. You know, like the numbers are actually there. It's about 500,000 in both cases, um, although Vermont's a little bit bigger. And I used to talk with my dad a great deal about just how different like community engagement and civic involvement and all those sorts of things makes the, the policy making and education delivery context in Vermont. And I'm curious to hear the thoughts of the panel on why it seems to be so rare that we take into account local context is even a Boston public school is going to be very different from a Miami-Dade mm -hmm. County public schools. And even in this conversation, mm -hmm. context hasn't come in that much. So I'm curious to hear, do you think the things you've said apply more or less in certain situations and or other thoughts you might have about how local context affects these ideas? Secretary, do you want to start? Context matters a lot. You know, and, and you know, it's you know, we are in a very anomalous states in so many ways. For example, in the state of Vermont, our students of color are taught by the best-paid teachers that make about ten thousand dollars more a year, and they have more experience than our our white students. Mm -hmm. Food to think about. So we confound everything in every way. What works in a rural area is completely what different from what works in an urban area. And for us, that's a place with 4, 40,000 kids. I mean, it's very small. So I think it does matter. And again, that's why we went with the inspectorate model. That's why we went with these integrated field reviews. And what we do is we pair systems that have a mix, but some similarities in the, in the problems of practice that they're trying to grapple with. Because we have systems that, for example, have figured out creative ways to leverage being small to get more out of it. And others that are really skilled at, or, or maybe need to learn something from them. So one of the most powerful pieces of these field reviews is, is letting systems learn from each other what works, but also what doesn't work. And what we're hoping to do is both elevate the promising practices through these field reviews, but also challenge people to see when they've struggled or not doing something well, have other people point that out, but also see that it can be done differently and better in another context. Because that's the kind of professional learning that I think leads to improved performance. So yeah, context matters a lot. I think that's a wonderful question. I'm really glad you asked it. Uh, because I think one of the main failures of the system we've had for the last, well, certainly since No Child Left Behind it in many states for 10 years before that, is that it ignored context, mm -hmm. right? And to give people credit, there was a good reason why it ignored context. It was a, a, it was a very crude way to try to improve equity, to basically mm -hmm. say, we yep. expect the same thing from low achieving schools as from others. Uh, but it's simply unrealistic. It's actually, when you think about it, kind of foolish. It, it's, the system assumes that a set of low test scores from a school with lousy teachers means the same thing as the, the similar scores from a school with very good teachers with a very transient population or with a bunch of kids who don't speak English. It just doesn't make any sense. But to, again, to be fair, it's an extraordinarily hard problem to solve. The question is, how can we sensibly take context into effect without letting schools that should be doing better off the hook. And that's what brings me yep. back to human judgment. Yep. Uh, and just one last sentence on that. The entire system, really, starting with the Kentucky reform of 1990 and going through ESSA, is based on the assumption that you can hold schools accountable with indicators that can be interpreted properly by somebody who's never seen the school. And that's just plain foolish. Mm -hmm. Quick comment by Tom. So one thing, Rebecca, another, I suggested one research project before. Here's another one that I think is interesting <laughs> for Vermont is, is it, one hypothesis is 
that because of the you know the large number of, of school committees around mm -hmm. the state, it could be that the form of political accountability that um, that existed before the test-based accountability in worked better and still works better in Vermont than right. than elsewhere. And one one way to test that would be to just see, like, for instance, if if the school committees all has kids in the, in their schools, um, and as a result, they're not they're less likely to look the other way when they see ineffective instruction. Is is it the case that less effective teachers exit more quickly in Vermont or not? Like so, so it could be that 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 the very type of governance in, in um, Vermont could increase the, the value of the feedback loop through the political process. As you yeah. say, yeah. it may not work I, I exactly. think one of our, we're actually one of the states with the highest per people expenditures in the country, and I think it's because people feel they right. own their schools, right. they're more likely to invest in them. So we have a very high investment per people. Compared I, to I just yeah. point out one downside to uh, mm -hmm. uh, context matters, right, which it definitely does, and it does in terms of implementation of policy. But too often I hear from schools, well, I can't learn from that school down the road because they don't, they don't deal with the kids that I deal with. And so that's, that's something I would be guarding against. Thank you very much. So many dissertation ideas, so little time. <laughs> um, we'll take a question over here, and if you could follow that model, thank you for doing that. Uh, please introduce yourself and, um, and where you're from. Uh, my name is Martina Meyer, and I am a former New York City public school teacher, now a master's of education policy and management student here at HDSE. I haven't heard um, the panel talking about the financial implications of the test-based accountability system. Just from my experience in New York City, um, decisions made around which publishers are awarded the contracts for creating the tests affect directly the uh, choices around which publishers we purchase test prep materials from and thereby creates a monopoly in that system. And I have, there's absolute evidence and I've mm -hmm. experienced it myself that those, uh, the prices of those materials are artificially inflated at the great um, profit of, of these publishers. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit about sort of the growing percentage of school budgets that are spent on these types of materials and at the expense of programs such as art, music, mm -hmm. movement, and other important educational pieces. You know, I don't know uh, what percentage of a budget or how much of a budget in Massachusetts is spent on materials that are supposedly aligned with our tests. I will say the good news is nobody's got a monopoly on claiming that they've got materials for schools aligned to our tests. <laughs> There's a lot of publishers out there that are willing to tell you that. It was, that was supposed yeah. to be a joke, by the way. <laughs> 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 but if McGraw is making the yeah. tests, you're not going to purchase test prep from Pearson. You're going to purchase test prep from... Well, the, in oh, context, I don't yeah. think, I don't think uh, yeah. th our choice of test, in fact, yeah. our test publisher doesn't publish uh, academic yeah. materials. Our, te our, our test uh, developer is, is measured progress. They, they're not in the business of uh, instructional okay. materials. Well, that's definitely not the case in New York, so yeah. I don't know how it is state by state. <laughs> in Vermont, we went with a Smarter Balance a consortium in part because it isn't a publisher yeah. of testing materials, and we've not done, I mean, it was interesting when the Obama administration said we had to cut back testing. We're already far below that level of testing, and there's really very little benchmark testing in the state of Vermont, so we don't see that. And all decisions about curricular are local decisions in Vermont. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know about mm -hmm. that specific contract in New York City, mm -hmm. but recall, if you take the estimates of the effects of test-based accountability on, on fourth and eighth grade math achievement. So through 2007, the, the, the D in Jacob paper I, I cited earlier estimated that, that um, No Child Left Behind Act had produced a 0.28 standard deviation um, gain just by, its, by itself. So just the effect of No Child Left Behind. States spend about um, Brookings had an estimate a couple of years ago about $1.8 billion a, a year on their testing program, $1.7 billion a year on their testing programs. So to get 0.28 standard deviations for $1.7 billion a year, 
would be a pretty high payoff relative to most other kinds of interventions. So like shrinking class size by 40% would cost a whale of a lot more than $1.7 billion. Um, and yet produces smaller effects on, on achievement at like 0.2. So like if you put this through like a cost benefit um, type of calculation and you take these estimates from what's been the effect of test-based accountability on achievement, I can't do it sitting here in this chair up in front of you, but my my bet would be that it would far surpass the benefit cost analyses of most of the things that we do, if not every other intervention that we have evidence. I uh, think it's for. worth I think it's worth entertaining though. I mean I had a daughter, one of the reasons I moved before I finished my dissertation was because my daughter was doing Taffy Raphael test prep books when it said science on the board every day in her class. And so I think it is worth acknowledging that sometimes these materials are used inappropriately and if teachers are being evaluated based on the test scores and they fear their job is in jeopardy, mm -hmm. you have created an incentive to invest in materials mm -hmm. that are aligned with the test. And alignment is a way of engaging in test prep. I think you have, that is a possibility, so it may be that you're in a system where that was yeah. happening. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. yep. Hi, I'm Patty Nolan. I am actually on the school committee here in Cambridge. Um, really appreciate all the focus on accountability and multiple measures. My question actually builds off something Commissioner Chester said, which is I am one of the ones who knows we are doing really, really well on international norms. In fact, our African American and low income students outperform Israel when you look at Tim's and P's and some of the others in Massachusetts. And yet we're constantly, all of us, as Professor Kane said, talking about the achievement gap and the, and the kids who aren't performing. How much of the accountability and testing system is trying to make sure that students themselves don't take it on themselves, that they are the ones who are failing? Because when they get those reports of I'm in needs improvement or I'm failing, both their parents and the kids themselves take it on that they are the ones who are failing. No matter how much we talk about it's to help teachers, it's to help our leaders to understand how to do better, that, when you combine it with research on stereotype threat, we know that that's what's causing all these kids to come to school so stressed out that they're throwing up in the classroom, which I've certainly seen in our district. So I think my question is, is there a way to use accountability? Is there anybody yeah. focusing on ensuring that students get the message effectively that it's really not about testing them so much as helping them reach those standards? And we, we have about 80,000 people in Massachusetts that are doing that. There, there are teachers and administrators the, uh, I don't mean to be too flip, but I, I, I have to say, I, I'm very skeptical about how many kids are throwing up in the classroom well, because, my, because my of anxiety. My daughter was one of them, and I I'm see it in Cambridge I'm very skeptical when I hear so. people say kids are coming to school throwing up in the classroom because of anxiety. I, 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 well, you just heard you know, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if that happened mm -hmm. occasionally, but, but the notion that that's mm -hmm. somehow ubiquitous or, or widespread, uh, I, I am a, a, a tremendous skeptic of. You know, the, the question, I mean, this is an important question that you ask, right? I mean, uh, the question is, um, how do you provide good signals? Good meaning they're actionable, they give a child, they give parents, as a parent of five kids, they give, they give teachers, accurate signals about where, whether this is a youngster who, boy, you better look a lot more carefully at what's happening with this kiddo because her literacy results are really bad based on this assessment. Now maybe this is an aberration, maybe she's an outstanding reader, you got that other evidence, then you don't have to worry. But you better look carefully, right? Um, and, and, and so how do you provide mom and dad the youngster, right, with, don't, don't whitewash it, right? If, if, if the one question I get more than any other from parents about the information they get back is, is my child where she should be? And, and, and that, that typically, you know, how, how you unpack that or how you translate that, is my child where the school system expects on grade level? not behind anybody's standard, but at least where she should be is the, is the thing that parents want. So if our, if our reporting uh, system on um, 
uh, back to, to kids and parents and educators isn't giving accurate and clear signals about that. We're missing the boat. I, I don't want to diminish the, the, the story about people stressing out, though. I mean, th there, there, there are two questions that these reports should be answering. The, the first is, should I be worried? And the second is, if so, what should I do? And I think the point that you're, you're reiterating is that there, I, I feel like there's been a disproportionate uh, de-emphasis of the second one as opposed to the first, right? The label of, uh, of, of, of below basic or um, needs improvement or whatever it is, um, is very salient. Uh, and that's important. Yeah. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't you know, sweep that under the rug. But then the follow-up question has to be answered by somebody. No, absolutely, absolutely, and I, and I don't mean to react so viscerally, but but I you know I, I just uh, someone's got to show me the data on how many kids are throwing up. I'll look for it. I, I, think <laughs> it's, I know it sounds flip, but the other thing we did is we tried to engage legislators and newspapers in taking the test, particularly at the eleventh grade level, and we we campaigned hard to get volunteers to do it. We only had three people who actually finished the test. It tells you something right there. It is a hard test. I know there's some other states who did it too, and I can tell you there are people with PhDs who can't pass that math test. And I think when people sit down and look at what we ask of our kids, I think it holds us accountable for having ambitious aspirational goals for them, but it also tempers some of the, the, the anxiety around it or the critique of it. So mm -hmm. um, while test-based accountability did not expand mm -hmm. uh, black-white achievement gaps, it didn't close them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what potentially one of, one of the reasons was that we have not been honest um, with parents that when their kid is off track. So um, huge proportions of parents report that, that they plan for their child to be a college graduate, even as late as, as uh, 11th, 12th grade, more than 90% of parents report that they're expecting their child will finish a bachelor's degree, and yet we know that the truth turns out to be wildly below that. About, you know, about a third right now, uh, 35, 36% of the population is gonna finish a bachelor's degree and uh, of the current cohorts. And I think part of the reason is we've been telling kids that they're proficient, they've been meeting standards when they're, when they're not. And, um, and I have to, I actually think that, that we have an obligation to, to let parents know earlier on uh, when their child is not on track and not have parents think, oh, everything's fine, the school's telling me I'm good, my kid's on grade level, when in fact they may be on grade level based on the lower standards, but they're actually not learning the skills that it's, that it's gonna require them to succeed in college. Somehow we have to balance that. I totally agree. We don't want to just provide the label without providing a sense for what can be done next or taking our own responsibility as administrators to, um, to intervene in schools that have been chronically underperforming. Un under ESSA, um, states will be able to concentrate their resources more than under No Child Left Behind that, that, that had a much larger number of schools that were, that were in school improvement status. Do you have, do you have a quick no, no. Okay, I, so, I, so what I'd next. like to do, um, speaking of equity, uh, this line lined up before that line, so I'm gonna hit this line next. Um, well, um, and after this, um, again, if you do still have a question, um, please line up now. Um, after this, we might go lightning round and just line up a bunch of questions, and um, we'll <laughs> frankly just pick the ones we like best. Is that what you're <laughs> <laughs> but we'll, this, we'll take one more question, then move to lightning round. Um, so my name is Deacon Aja. I'm an EdTech entrepreneur focusing on assessment technology for open response questions. And so my question is about the multiple choice question versus the open response question to be used to measure the accountability. Mm -hmm. um, in master mm -hmm. sets, I commend the commissioner for redesigning the MCAS because there is a lot of focus on writing. And uh, unfortunately, in the recently released MCAS results, we find that 51% um, of the students are scoring less than two out of four on open response questions. Um, so what should we do to encourage uh, better performance so sorry, did you say what can we do to increase what? So should we increase the open response question um, as a measure of uh, measuring the accountability? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, right? And, and in, in the development of uh, large-scale assessments, there's always uh, an issue of trade-offs, um, which we're working through as we speak in Massachusetts because we're developing a next-generation assessment. One of the trade-offs is how ambitious 
the range of content and the kinds of performances that you ask students to do on the test, open-ended and so forth, are. But that's, that, that has to be traded off against how much time are you going to spend on okay. the testing, how expensive is it going to be to score it and score it consistently. Um, and so those are, those are trade-offs that we're navigating right now as we're building our next generation assessment. We want to continue to have a very healthy mix of open-ended, uh, constructed responses. Uh, we're, we're in fact, we've expanded. Uh, we're, we're, we have items, we will have items this spring which we have not had previously on the MCAS, where students will have to read multiple perspectives on a topic and, and compare and contrast those uh, through a written product. So we believe um, that it's, it's important that we're not just measuring knowledge recall, but that we're measuring thinking skills, expression skills, ability to, to, uh, to think critically, uh, to, to discern variation in perspectives on a given topic. Uh, and apply your knowledge, apply those math skills to uh, a real world problem solving setting. I think it was uh, Rich Hill who said you can have uh, tests that are, um, uh, you want tests to be reliable, valid, and cheap, but you can only have two of the three. <laughs> yeah. So um, Tom and then Rebecca, and then we should go lightning round. So, so I think we got the trade off wrong before Park and SBAC. I, I believe we had too few uh, constructed response items, especially on the English tests. And part of the reason why I say that is, so remember, I, I, I described gains in math, but not gains in, in literacy. I'm surprised nobody's asked about why. One hypothesis is that the literacy assessments that most states were using until just the last few years basically were you read a passage and you answer um, multiple choice questions. Where in middle school grades and high school grades, we want teachers to be teaching kids to write. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think that, so under the park uh, and at the Smarter Balance assessments, we've actually seen some evidence that under those assessments, they're more sensitive to teacher effects. That the variation in achievement gains associated with teachers on these new assessments looks much more similar between math and um, literacy than under the old tests where you saw big effects of teachers in math and much smaller effects of teachers in, in um, literacy. It remains to be seen whether that you know, continues, but, but I, one hypothesis is that that was because we were testing things in English that weren't the things that teachers were teaching in, in middle schools and high schools. So speaking of, our, um, uh, of testing and grading, let's get um, the question up here um, mm -hmm. and people can respond to it while we um, get um, all five, oh sorry, yeah, uh, all five questions I, um, after I, I was glad you mentioned the three things and one of the challenges, I was actually quite angry at Dan for quite a while because in Vermont we had a very well developed portfolio system yeah. which, which About that. educators loved yeah. because it, it, was, um, it was really performance We called it a worthwhile burden. It was a worthwhile <laughs> burden is what we called it. And we had to give it up with the advent of No Child Left Behind because we couldn't achieve sufficiently high levels of right, reliability right. to use it for accountability purposes. Yep. And it was, it was a real loss. People still talk right. about it. Yep. Um, so if you could please respond um, to this question, we'll get our Except grades behind a, us. A, um, the reason, and it's not blind. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, we'll do our best. Um, uh, if, and if we could just go, um, and if you could just go, just keep trying to keep your questions um, short if you can, and um, introduce yourselves. Yeah, so I wanted to pick up on what Rebecca was talking about and what I'm hearing here. I, I'm pretty sure that if we had subjected you all to a multiple choice test and gotten your scores and rated you and then walked out, we wouldn't have learned as much as we're learning by really thinking through the issues with you. And. Um, so I started a charter school with Ted Sizer. That might tell you a little bit where I'm coming from. And the rubrics and criteria we use, some of them were derived from Vermont system 20 years ago. And so I'd really like to know, why are we back to talking about tests when you're all really clear that what we're trying to talk about is how can we make learning visible, our children's learning to their parents, to the community? How can uh, we help teachers learn how to think about the criteria by which they're evaluating student progress? Because test and test scores really tell you very little. And the primary stakeholders don't really know 
what their ch children have and haven't learned that method, but there are a variety of other methods, exhibitions like the one tonight, portfolios that, and so I, I'm just wondering why do we keep talking about testing when we talk about accountability mm -hmm. and the visibility of learning? Thank you. Um, uh, noted, and we'll uh, get the other four questions. Hi, I'm Emily. I've been teaching for eight years in Philadelphia, Holyoke, Lawrence, and New York City. I think something that um, is important to address is how high stakes accountability actually relates to the cycle of poverty and how it reinforces larger structural inequalities for low income students of color. Um, a really quick example of what I would love to talk about there would be like at a school I worked at that was at the highest level of failure in Lawrence, we taught them to become test taking robots and now it's level one. Yep. And that has prepared them for entry level jobs that don't require critical thinking and I don't feel good about what I did at that school and I don't feel good about the futures of their children. So the way we've chosen to respond to this issue is frankly racist. I'd love to talk about that. You should take a, um, a S11, um, Dan's course next semester, and we'll, we'll cover, cover that in detail. Uh, th thank you. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to uh, raise some issues that follow up with what you were talking about. Test-based accountability is a solution that we are trying to uh, offer for disparities in uh, educating our children as a country. Uh, first of all, we're assuming that schools can make up for all the other factors that mm -hmm. impact how well students learn and what they learn. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's an accurate assumption. It may be. Um, but uh, the question is whether teaching those children uh, and uh, trying to measure what we teach is the most effective way to try to make up for those disparities that exist, or if it might be more effective to give all their parents good jobs, for example. Mm -hmm. So I want to raise that issue. I also want to raise the issue that um, we're talking about test-based accountability as though it were monolithic. I think it's very different for a subject like mathematics than it is for a subject like science. Mm -hmm. Um, it's much easier. We, we I'm sorry, because I think, I think we get the question. I, I hate to cut us off, but I, if I had a grade for a moderator, I would be failing right now. It's uh, it's 7:30, um, okay. but I do want to get Thomas, um, and then we'll uh, we'll wrap up. And I'm really sorry. Um, I, I think we'll have to move on. Okay. Thanks. Just really quick. I'm Thomas, a PhD student coming most immediately from Chicago. Um, we've glanced on this a little bit, but I was I was wondering about the idea of you know we've been talking about accountability as kind of a summative metric and using it to kind of rate schools or teachers or districts or students, um, but we're also using these tests, or at least trying to tell teachers to use these tests as formative assessments, how to, you know, where to improve student learning there. And I was wondering if people would talk about whether that's exactly what we want to be doing, we should be, you know, informing what we should teach based on what we're being rated on, or that's the exact opposite of what we want to be doing, that those two things, we, we shouldn't be trying to get the same test to do those two different things. If you look at our, our cheat sheet, that was one of our questions. I did not know. <laughs> Thanks, so, Thomas. Nor have um, I taken either of your classes. So, uh, um, I, I, <laughs> um, let, let's, let's go one by one and pick the uh, question that I'll that take the like last this. one. Yeah. Uh, I think the answer is, if I'm remembering which way you phrased it, absolutely not. Uh, first of all, uh, formative assessments, if they're really going to be used for formative purposes, should be de designed in entirely different ways than we design summative assessments. And, uh, and the fact that we are now including constructed response questions, which I agree is a good thing, makes the summative assessments even less able to serve diagnostic purposes because there are fewer items on them, there are typically no subscales and so on. But there's another reason, which is that um, a former colleague, well, you, I don't know if you overlapped with Audrey Qualls at the University of Iowa, but she liked to say that um, if kids really know it, they have to be able to do it when faced with unfamiliar particulars. That was her phrase. It's an ugly phrase, but it's exactly right. If you want to make sure that a kid knows what is going to be tested on what happens if you say item 17 on the uh, summative test, that student should have that skill or that knowledge assessed in ways that look nothing like the summative test, nothing like it at all. If you are presenting it to them, supposedly formatively, in a way that looks like the summative test, you're just doing test prep, right? What you really need to communicate to teachers is, if this particular skill is important, you want your kids to be able to, to, to show it 
in as wide a range of possible situations as possible. Otherwise, it, the gains are just bogus. So I'm not going to hold my breath until um, Donald Trump gets everybody a good job. Um, <laughs> I'd rather states design uh, test-based accountability <laughs> systems that acknowledge the fact that students start from different uh, um, starting points. We do know that there are school models that actually do have very large impacts, uh, are capable of mm -hmm. closing the achievement gap, even among students from very disadvantaged backgrounds. And we've learned that in the last a uh, few years, particularly here in Massachusetts. Uh, there are a set of charter schools that were based on random assignment, uh, lottery-based data are having gigantic effects on student achievement working with disadvantaged students. That said, there are lots of students that are starting from, from lower starting points and our accountability systems need to take account of that. Fortunately, in ESSA does allow um, uh, states to include a growth um, measure as part as one of the things that that they look at and, and I uh, which again a growth measure accounts for the fact for what students starting point was and even though even growth measures are not perfect they're they're a step in that direction and I and I hope states do that thanks Tom yeah um, you know, I think the, the, the questions cover a wide range of, of, of ground. I, we've, we've got to pay attention to the, the life factors of kids outside of school, no question about it. Uh, but having said that, I'm heartened by the research that I've paid attention to, which says schools can make a difference. Teach, good teaching can make a difference. I mean, that gives me all kinds of optimism, right? Kids can come from terrible circumstances, and schools can make a difference in whether they end the, the year way behind or end the year a little bit behind or end the year a little bit ahead. And, and we've seen that time after time. Uh, the, the, the PISA data, this is okay to say, <laughs> the PISA data that's being released tomorrow focuses on science. Every year the, there's three subjects tested with a focal su subject. It turns out that when uh, the, the uh, calculus of what accounts for the greatest variation in science achievement across the OECD countries, and it holds up in the US too, it's not family background, because they ask the students a, a range of questions, and in the US we provide them with uh, qualifying for free and reduced lunch and, and other statistics. It's that, that accounts for the minority of the variation in achievement. It's instructional decisions as reported to students, as reported by students, uh, the kind of instruction they're getting in science, the, the school practices and students' attitudes towards science account for the greatest variation. Those are things that we can influence. That without having some accountability system that shines a light on where we're getting that job done, we're gonna, we're gonna fail at this. Thanks, Commissioner. Secretary. Uh, we looked at the OECD, some of the work on that too, and what we saw was that the systems where the least amount of variation was explained by differences in things like socioeconomics were also the systems that were the high-performing systems. And so to me, it goes back to the issue mm -hmm. of equity. How do we design an equitable system? And again, the legacy of No Child Left Behind, when, you, when it's a competitive model and you rank and sort, when parents who are high attainment parents see that a school doesn't have a great test score, parents of means can relocate. So what mm -hmm. we see in Vermont is increasing socioeconomic segregation in the state, mm -hmm. increasing racial segregation. And when you look at work out of the Civil Rights Project, for example, we are now as segregated as we were, we were pre-desegregation. That's something we should all think about because we have to find a way as a country to figure out how we can be better by working together and not by ranking and sorting because it isn't, it isn't working right now. Thank you all very much. You can see how much we enjoy this topic. We're seven minutes over. Thank you all.